The classic lens maker's formula that tells the focal point of a lens is deceptively simple because it applies only to a theoretical lens which could never be made. The focal length math for a real lens with spherical faces is more complicated but still relatively tractable. However, spherical faces produce a fuzzy focus and the math required for better shapes is difficult to solve. Consequently, aspheric lenses are normally designed using brute force approximation. One kind of aspheric lens stands out as an exception. Rotating a two-dimensional ellipse around its major axis produces a three-dimensional ellipsoid. A lens with an ellipsoidal face will precisely focus an incident beam at a point that is so easy to calculate you can almost do it in your head. Unfortunately, there are only a few situations where a single-face lens is useful, but this can be the starting point for some very good two-face lenses and it is instructive in any case. This egg shape represents an ellipsoidal glass lens. A light beam parallel to the major axis hits the end of the egg at an infinite number of points, but at every point, the difference between the speed of light in air and in glass causes the beam to bend the exact amount to redirect it to the second focus of the ellipse. There is no other point like this in an ellipse or in any other figure. It is unique. It's hard to trace the path of light based on its electromagnetic reality, but some standard simplifications enable us to get a handle on the problem. The first is to see the beam as a flat wall moving toward and crashing into the end of the lens. To avoid the complexity of 3D geometry, we can work with a 2D slice, where the ellipsoidal lens becomes an ellipse and the wave plane becomes a line, the wave front. We see the beam as an infinite number of individual rays perpendicular to the wavefront and therefore parallel to the ellipse major axis. Each ray begins at some point R at an unknown position. Anything we prove for R applies to all points and therefore the entire beam. Each ray travels through a distance D1 from R to the lens. Upon entering the glass, the ray bends and travels a distance D2 to a point F on the lens axis. Light travels faster in air than in glass. Refractive indices N1 and N2 indicate the relative speeds in air and glass. The longer D1 is, the more time the ray travels at the N1 speed. The longer D2 is, the more time the ray travels at the N2 speed. The total travel time from R to F is D1 times N1 plus D2 times N2. This optical path length is akin to traditional African maps that show distances not as the crow flies, but by how long it takes a person to walk them. If the lens bends every ray to aim at the same point F, the wave front is compressed into a smaller space and the lens concentrates the beam. However, this is only one of two conditions that the lens must meet to focus the beam. The other is that every path must take exactly the same time to traverse. If this is not true, then the rays lose their relative positions in time, making the beam less orderly. This smears images and makes the beam more difficult to control. We are going to prove that both conditions can be met by an ellipse whose eccentricity is equal to the ratio of N1 over N2 in which case the trailing ellipse focus point is the lens focus. We will be using two different but compatible definitions of ellipse. One definition is the set of points, the sum of whose distances from two fixed points is constant. This diagram illustrates what this means. P is any point on the ellipse. F1 is the ellipse focus near the lens face, and F2 is the trailing focus. The distance from P to F1 is P. The distance from P to F2 is Q. This definition says simply that P plus Q is the same for all points P. The second definition is the set of points such that for each point, the ratio of distance to a given point, F1, and to a line, the directrix, perpendicular to the major axis, is constant. Referring to the same diagram, we add the horizontal line of length d from p to the directrix. This definition says simply that the ratio of p over d is the same for all p. 
The definition incidentally tells us that the ratio is equal to the eccentricity of the ellipse. Eccentricity essentially describes the curve of the ellipse by indicating the ratio of its major and minor axes. We would expect this to have a major influence on how the lens behaves, and it does. Two other important items in this diagram are that the ellipse foci, f1 and f2, are the same distance, f, from the center, and the major axis vertices are the same distance, a, from the center. We can combine these details with ellipse definition 1, that p plus q is the same for all points, to derive a more immediately useful relationship. By definition, P is any point of the ellipse, including this vertex. We know things about this vertex that we don't know about other points. Its P is obviously equal to A minus F. Its Q is equal to F plus F plus A minus F. Adding these two equations yields this one equation, which can be reduced to P plus Q equals 2A, which we will be using. With these preliminaries out of the way, let's first tackle the equal path proof. We invent two constants, j and k, for which j over k equals e. We don't know what their actual values are, but since p over d equals e for all ellipse points, j over k equals p over d for all points. Note that j and k are constants, while p and d are variables. Only their ratios are equal. From p plus q equals 2a, we get p equals 2a minus q. And substituting this for p, we get j over k equals 2a minus q over d. Cross multiplying this equation produces j times d equals k times 2a minus q. Adding kq to both sides yields jd plus kq equals k 2a. Since k and a are both constant, JD and KQ must be constant. This looks a lot like the optical path link. If J equals N1 and K equals N2, the optical path link is constant. Since E equals J over K, if E equals N1 over N2, the optical path lengths for all P to F2 are equal. There are several ways to prove the second focus requirement that all paths lead to F2. The most obvious would be based on how much the light bends at every point due to the angle of the ellipse face at that point. But that proof is complicated by essentially irrelevant angle calculations. A much simpler proof can be developed from Fermat's principle, which is that light travels the shortest optical path, the one that takes the least time to traverse. We invent a variable lambda, which represents the optical path length from any p of the ellipse to f2. Lambda equals n1 times d plus n2 times q. From the first ellipse definition, eccentricity e equals p over d, and therefore p equals ed. From the second definition, we derived p plus q equals 2a, and therefore q equals 2a minus p. Substituting ed for p, we get q equals 2a minus ed. Substituting this for one of the instances of d in the optical path length, we get lambda equals n1 times d plus n2 times 2a minus ed, or n1 times d plus n2 times 2a minus n2 times ed. Since n1, n2, a, and e are all constants, the derivative of lambda over d is n1 minus n2 times e. So why do we care so much about the derivative? Because lambda is minimum or maximum when the derivative of lambda over d is zero. Fermat wants us to find the shortest optical path, i.e. minimum lambda, which occurs when n1 minus n2 times e equals zero, from which we get n1 equals n2 times e, and finally e equals n1 over n2. Therefore, if E equals N1 over N2, the optical path length from any P to F2 is minimum.